Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. It's nice to have you with me today. My guest is Beth Sachs. Hi, Beth, how are you? Great, how are you, Melinda? This is I'm, a thrill and an honor. I'm, I'm really good, and it's just so great to have you on my show today. Um, for my viewers, let me share a little bit about Beth Sachs. Beth has been in the field of sustainable energy, energy efficiency, and renewable energy for 40 years probably even longer than that. She co-founded the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, a mission-driven nonprofit that services Efficiency Vermont. Right? Yes, that's right. And then many, many, many other things um, that you have done. So I wanna share with our viewers that 40 years ago, I met you and your late husband, Blair, and it was when we were just starting division for the Burlington Waterfront. And you all, and I think John Quinney might be, have been involved and maybe a few other people. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you met with us, with Lisa and I, to talk about district heating for the waterfront. And, yes. And that was the first time that I met you. And you were that many, many years ago already in, as, a, as a young woman trying to save our planet. So that was when you and I first met and then we served on boards together and it's been a wonderful friendship over the years. Now, um, you co-founded VEIC with your late husband, Blair. Um, Beth, can you talk a little bit about the early days and what inspired the two of you to take on this project? Well, it's, it's interesting when Blair and I met, it was before the oil embargo of 1972. And energy was not an issue. It was cheap, too cheap to meter. That was the quote. And so I met Blair and a group of really interesting architects who were interested in trying to think about architecture that had low impact on the land. And so when I met Blair, he was building a one acre bubble, inflatable bubble that was the Antioch campus in Maryland. It was beautiful and it was just great. And um, right just in the middle of doing that, the oil embargo hit, and a lot of people who had been interested in that kind of architecture all swiveled to how can we make buildings that are more efficient and use less energy. Um, and from there, we just, you know, it's just been an interesting journey. Um, the reason we started VEIC um, in particular was... My mother lived in a um, row house in Baltimore City. I don't know if you know what those look like, but they're tall and skinny. So she lived in one that was four stories, um, pretty typical, and you know, one or two rooms of her build per story. It was always hot on the top floor, unbearably hot, and it was always cold, really cold on the first floor. And there was she was trying to get some help to figure out what to do. And there was nowhere she could go where the, where someone would say, let's figure out what you need. The only options she had were contractors who were trying to sell her some kind of heating system or cooling system or whatever. So Blair and I realized that what we needed, what people needed was an advocate. They needed someone who was interested in helping them very specifically figure out what they needed without being tied to any kind of equipment or even any kind of um, energy source, like electricity or gas or anything like that. And so that was really how we figured out that this was a service that was needed and started VEIC. So it really uh, bloomed out of even a, a very strong social justice, uh, you know, premise um you were you oh, were always you, you were you were part were you part of the 60s movement you were um did you and and i and i believe that our generation i mean earth day all of it was starting to think okay. about that but but beth you in particularly have significantly influenced the global sustainability energy industry so can you talk to us about that and how your life's work since the early 1980s focused on a healthy planet well, you know, I think it's always been an issue of what's what's fair, what's fair, and uh, what's good, for, what's 
good for sustaining life on Earth. And so when I first heard about the concept of global warming so many years ago, and what was first being discussed, it was a terrifying thought. The idea that we could be doing so much 40, 50 years ago, that was we wouldn't know what the impacts would look like. And yet we weren't, people weren't gonna respond until you could, until you could see them. And that's really scary because then it was gonna be too late. And now I fear we're at that point. So I think that um, it's always been for me an issue of we're trashing this place and we need to take better care of it. And the people who are gonna be affected first and hardest are the people who can't afford to make choices because they don't have resources. Does that answer does, your question? Yes, yes, it does. And um, and so so tell me what brought you and Blair to Vermont? Uh, it's a long story I could try to make short, but I worked um, early on after the embar um, oil embargo in Montreal in, in a, at a research institute that was related to McGill. And Blair was going to architecture school there and building solar buildings on Cree reserves in Northern Quebec. That was his senior, that was his thesis. And um, we met a lot of people who we worked really well with. And then we all scattered, Blair and I went and started a business out in California, the only for-profit I've ever worked for, still traded on NASDAQ today. Wow. Um, and we move, and then we moved to Montana after we got that off the ground, brought all the people back who were friends who had worked together in Montreal, worked at the National Center for Appropriate Technology in Butte, Montana. And after a couple of years decided we wanted to all come back to the East Coast, but we wanted to live on our own sides of the border because half of us are Canadian and half from the US. So we picked Newport, Vermont off a map and Blair and I moved there. Oh, that's so fascinating. I had no clue. I had no idea. And, yeah. and you and and you and Blair co-founded Vermont Energy Investment Corp. Um, mm -hmm. And that and that is it is a nonprofit. Yes. And it's best known in Vermont and around the world as implementing the implementing the first statewide energy efficiency utility yes. and reducing the energy cost is the goal, especially for low income folks. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that. Um, well, the idea, you know, for better or worse, maybe it's success that Efficiency Vermont is now kind of a household word and it feels it feels like an institution. But when we thought about the concept 25 years ago, it was very radical. The idea that you could have a regulated utility that would not sell electricity, that would instead contribute to what we need by saving electricity. And so it was, it was, had never been done before. And we had some great people at, in state government and great people, regulators in the state who were all interested in making this happen. And we did. And since then, you know, we have an efficiency utility in Washington, DC. We helped start efficiency New Brunswick, efficiency Nova Scotia. Um, all over the country and around the world. Well, mostly Canada and the United States. Well, it's extraordinary. Now, and your focus has always been to reduce the environmental costs also yes. of energy use, not just yes. the, what it costs for the, the user of energy, but also the environmental costs. You merged right. those two. And certainly when you came to us to talk about district heating, it was so such a novel, I mean, the thing about you and Blair is your thinking was so forward thinking decades and decades and decades before, you know, Al Gore's, you know, incredible movie. Um, yeah. You guys were, and, and it's, I, I just find that extraordinary that what, talk to me a little bit about your, your childhood and what, what is it about you growing up? Um, that made you be such a forward-thinking leader, um, not just in this in, in this industry, but in your life. Right. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, um, I grew up in a in a Jewish ghetto until I was ten years old, 
in Baltimore. And then my parents moved us to a place outside between Baltimore and Washington that was completely undeveloped and didn't like Jews. And so I was not treated very well. I was spit on and, and things like that. And so I just got this, you know, incredible sense of, I think, fairness and what's fair and what's not. Um, and that really compelled me. And so in high school, um, I organ it was before girls could wear pants to school. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And I organized a campaign all of my senior year and we got suspended every month when I did a, we organized girls wearing pants and then we all got sent home. Um, I have a really strong sense of, of what's fair and what's not, I think. And I don't know, that probably came from my parents and from being not treated very fair, very nicely when I moved at 10 years old. And you were a child, but what- I was what, expelled from high school for profanity and insubordination, as a matter of fact. Well, that does not surprise me. Well, we don't need to go into the details. <laughs> no, we don't, but, but bless your heart for being a, a champion of, of women and, and so many other, but what, what inspired you to move into energy? Was it your mother living in that high rise that because and, and the field that you went into was not no, was not necessarily one that women went into, and you not no, only I felt not, really and you not only went into it, you, you 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 crashed the glass ceiling and transformed the way that people look at energy around the world. So talk to uh -huh. us a little bit about what that electrical charge was that got you to focus in that direction. I think you know the oil embargo made a huge impact. I don't know. I mean, you probably talk remember about that. when we had. We'll talk about that because we had to line up to, you know, people had to line up and you could get gas on different days depending on what your license plate number was and things like that. And during the Nixon, it was, it was a hardship for a lot of people. Was it during and the Nixon me, administration? It, was it during I, the Nixon administration that that happened, or was it? Yes. I can't remember. It was the Nixon, and so tell us a little bit about it. With it, it basically there was an oil embargo, and and because I can't, I don't remember that very well because I'm, but it went, and people were in lines for hours and hours trying to get gas for their vehicles, and that had a huge impact on you. And where were you when that happened? I was in Maryland, okay. um, and the. You know, it's interesting because the oil embargo in 72 was not about scarcity. It was about control. I think now it's much more about control. I mean, about scarcity and and the impact on the environment. At the time, it was really, oh, you know, OPEC can control us. And so it was really, I think, in some ways more political in a way. Um. And how old were you? But it just it just made me re it just made me realize that there were such different ways of doing things, like solar energy, that you could capture it and you could store it and you could use it, and uh, that you were just self more self reliant. When did that first? When did solar power come into your brain? Because it certainly didn't come into most of ours. For I mean, were you a science? Were you were you? Did no, you not at all. I I was, if anything, an art major. But I made up. I went to seven colleges and made up a degree in what they call we we called environmental design. Wow. Um, and and Blair, who you've referred to quite a few times, you know, he had I met him and and met this group of architects that were so fascinating you know, who were first working on inflatables and, and less impact on the land. And it was just a really easy transition to passive solar. How but could you build buildings that wouldn't need energy or nearly as much? But you also have run and founded a, a, a very extraordinary uh, nonprofit, VEIC, and you were the founder and the and the executive director for years, and it was a big business. So you must have honed your business skills as well, or did that come natural to you? That was just luck. I mean, I don't know, Melinda, if you've had the same thing, we didn't get trained in anything, right? We just learned it on the job. Um, yeah, I mean, when Blair and I started VEIC, we thought, you know, it might grow to 25 people. And at its 
height, I don't know what it is now. It had 320 employees um, and I think a $95 million budget. And I remember the first time we got, we had a million dollar budget and I thought, oh my Lord, we run a million dollar company. You know, and now it's a hundred million dollars. Um, yeah. Well, I call, was, I, I call it the power of naivete that we, that as women, we, we weren't, we weren't pushed into the, the careers that certainly women today are choosing. Um, and, it, and we, and I, for me, I had to make it up as I went along and fortunately I, I opened the right doors and got through and I had a lot of support from people who knew what they were doing, but I call that the power of na naivete. And so I, I want to segue now a little bit to kind of where we are. Uh, we're halfway through our interview here, uh, where we are as a, as a plan and, and as a society, do you believe Beth, that the state of Vermont and local communities are doing enough to help folks without means to switch to re renewables? No, but I think that even the fact that we diff that we now acknowledge it is really important. You know, that there's, you know, 10 years ago, I was always trying at VEIC to talk about the, the, the confluence of energy justice, environmental justice, and social justice, always. And now I feel like it's part of the dialogue at the state level, at the federal level, it's amazing. And I think there's an awareness that we've never had before. Um, and so I do think that it looks promising. I think that people really, when making investments in new programs and new program designs, it's not an afterthought anymore. How is this going to have an impact on low income people and people with less means and disadvantaged communities? But um, so do we have time to, to do it? I hope so. Um, well, I just I so I want to I want to just challenge you a little bit on that, because um, 10 years ago, we put in solar panels um, and for 10 years, we didn't have an electric bill. And then they changed the rates um, through the through the utility, and now we're getting less back in the net metering than we did before, and we're um, and we just paid off the mortgage. So th that that I I think I, I wrote, actually wrote a commentary about that just a few weeks ago because it it bothered me that this that and and we were able to do that we did we were able to get a mortgage and do that but how many people can do that i, I remember i remember meeting bernie sanders you might have been there for a vbsr meeting you might have been in that room when bernie mm -hmm. said every, every house in vermont should have a solar every every house across the country should have a solar panel and that was what 15 20 years ago so i'm just wondering if there's more that we can do as a state to in to to help people who don't have the means to switch to renewables to do it to make it so that it's it's not a, bur a financial burden for them right well you know i have this depressing thought that i'll put out there which is the amount of money that we have spent over the last 25 30 40 years trying to convince people to put solar on their roofs and insulate their houses is phenomenal. And I just, I would love to collect that information and and see if, what if we just spent it all on buying it and doing it? I mean, it was so much money. And I think we still are of that mindset that really that it's going to happen in the market. And personally, I don't think it's going to happen through the market. I think it's going to happen through policy and building codes and standards um, and mandates. I think it has to. I don't think we have time to convince people to do the right thing. Well, I did the research and it would be $4.2 trillion to get solar on every building in this country. So I did my research on, I know that, and it would take a few years of, of taking some money out of our defense budget. But I think that we could start moving in that direction where Absolutely. our government helps people to say, look, let us let us do this for you. We'll come in and do this for you in the same way that they build roads and they keep up our roads. Right. It should or be F-35s. How really? many? We won't even don't even need to go there. I'm I. But yes. OK, so I'm so you and I need to 
and I'm sure we're, we're going to stay right on this issue. Now, I want to move on to your being a strong advocate for women and women's issue. And I know, like me, we've talked about this. You must be deeply concerned about the current affairs around access to reproductive health care for women around the country. How are you feeling about the way things are going in our country for women on that? No, it's just it's just shocking to me. You and I are of a certain age and we had were we could possibly have gotten pregnant before Roe v. Wade, <laughs> you know, and the idea that that uh, and that was terrifying back then. And we take it. I don't take it for granted. But most people younger than me do, and, I, and I'm glad they do, and they should. But this is, I mean, this is all just about politics. This is all just about having, getting, having the right people in office who, who care about this. It's absolutely a travesty. It's hard to believe that it happened. And it's a way of holding women down. Um, now I want to I want to recognize you that in 2016 you received the Leadership and Achievement Award from the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership. You were honored as an influential champion, leader, and innovator to unleash the power of energy efficiency as equitable, affordable, and sustainable energy resource. Um, talk to us about getting that award and how that felt for you. Certainly, it was so well deserved. Well, you know, it's funny. It was I think it was called the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I think it was the same year that I got, I was honored to get the VBSR Terry Eric Award. That's right. I think they were in the same year. And I thought, I'm not done. <laughs> you know, and when you, that kind of thing comes to you, you think, you know, I don't, I didn't for a minute think I had, uh, I had peaked, but it was a great honor. They both were a great honor, both of them. And I do want to recognize the Terry Eric Award because I was there for that event and it was it, so well deserved. Now, you have been saying that all people need and deserve clean air, clean water, and the means to support themselves and the freedom to live their lives with dignity. With the situation in this country where democracy and human rights and freedoms are being challenged, how do we make strides amidst these times we are living in now? It's a big question. I think for me, a big part of answering that question personally was creating an institution such as VEIC that really uh, that really respected people, that created a workplace that was dignified and fair and equitable and not sexist and not homophobic and you know racist and i think that to me creating those kinds of models and institutions is really important so when i go and talk to people and uh, meet, meet people who worked at veic there are hundreds of people who have come and gone from there and gone off to do other work in other places um and are continuing to do really great work and do it in. And one of the things that I'm hope I hope I have done is with the young staff who have started at VEIC started to create expectations that this is how we can work together. And to um, me, that workplace is really important. Because they take that with them. That becomes their. Yes their internal way of doing business. And then when they 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 have a staff and they're managing, they say, I want to manage it the way I, I was it was at VEIC. Now you state a lot about efficiency, that efficiency comes first. So for my viewers um, who are who are watching, can you talk to us a little bit about um, how they can become engaged and take advantage of the services of at Efficiency Vermont? And I and to my viewers, I just want to also tell you that you should go to the website um, which is www.veic.org. Uh, there's so much information on that website. It's a great website. But how do my viewers get involved in the Efficiency Vermont program, Beth? Well, that's interesting because I've been away from that for quite a while now. And But I think I know that the customer support team is phenomenal. They don't, it's not a group of people who answer the phone and then find somebody to, 
to give an answer to people. They have become experts themselves in so many areas and they're incredibly helpful. I mean, I think that they are just a real gem at VEIC. And so I really wouldn't hesitate to tell people to just call them and they have so much information and uh, interest, caring about find, helping people find what they need. And if they don't, they'll find who does. So and I just say, you know, the you're not being, it's not a, it's, it's not a gateway. It's a really great service. So VEIC.org, visit the website, make a call. Um, they will, it's an efficiency Vermont and efficiency Vermont. Um, and it's, I think is dot com. Dot com. Efficiency Vermont. I don't know why. Um, but it, but the, I've, I've used them. Certainly we use them at the project and it's personal and it's, um, it's really valuable service. Um, so talk to us about what you're working on now, Beth, come on. What, what's your, what's your next big illuminating project? Well, I'm working now on divestment. I think that getting uh, the banks and all of us out of supporting oil uh, is a really critical piece. It's something I feel like I can kind of get my hands around. I'm working with an organization called Third Act, which Bill McKibben started about three years ago. And it's seniors who have lots of knowledge and experience and more time than they have, and in many cases, more resources when they than when they were working. I mean, it's it's not just retired people, but mostly. And it has been just fantastic to me, this whole new group of people who really during their careers may never have even thought about energy and climate change, and now are really engaged and are bringing skills as lawyers and teachers and artists. And it's really exciting. So I would say, go look up Third Act Vermont. We won't turn you away if you're under 60, but uh, if you're interested, uh, it's great. We do, you know, we've done a lot of different kinds of actions. We're trying to pass a bill in the legislature to divest, to have the state, sorry, oh, no. <laughs> divest its pension funds from fossil fuels. And I'm personally working on making sure that people understand once they do cut up their credit cards to the four big banks that are mostly in, you know, that are promoting fuel, fossil fuels, that they know where to go. So you cut up your credit card from Citibank, where do you go to do banking that, that uh, matches your values? So that's one of the projects I'm working on. That's fascinating. Um, so Beth, we're coming to the end of our show. Where do you see the future of our species? on a changing planet over the next couple of decades. You and I probably still have another 20 years left, but where do you see our species with the changing planet? Wow, that's a big question. I try to stay optimistic in spite of the fact that I think the changes that have happened to our climate are terrifying and threatening and all I can do is hope that we have the wherewithal to change it and and turn it around before it's too late. I I don't think Saturn is the answer. I think we have to solve. I don't think we can go there, Saturn or the Moon. We've or got to figure out what's going on here, and we have to do it in a way that doesn't create greater wealth for rich people and greater opportunities and wipes out. 90% of the planet. And I and I think I think people also need to vote. And not every candidate's going to be perfect when it comes to climate. And I know a lot of environmentalists hold certain politicians' feet to the fire and are very critical. But at the end of the day, you've got to measure which candidate is really supporting climate change. It may not be perfect, and it may not be as much as we feel we need, but we have to be careful that we don't elect people who actually say that climate change is not real. We're going to pull out of the Paris Accord. I mean, that's another thing. And I think environmentalists, there's a couple of things that environmentalists need to focus a little bit on, on uh, reproductive health too, because population Absolutely. is important. And, I, and, I, and I've certainly talked to Bill McKibben about that. 
And I think that that's a direction that they need to focus on, but also to, to, to be more gentle with politicians who maybe aren't perfect, but they're really where we need to go. And if we don't get behind them and support them, we could end up in a place which would be horrifically terrible for the planet and our species. So I think encouraging people to vote for the right candidate is really important, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And I do a lot of electoral politics trying to get people to vote, get them out to vote, and get them out to vote in a progressive manner. I mean, let's face it, it's not just vote, like you said. I totally agree with what you're saying. I think it's amazing to... I think that we have to really think about building coalitions. There are, it, we, you know, right now, biomass is really a very charged issue in the state and wind has been too. And we have to go beyond those to figure out when to hold them and when to fold, you know, and when to compromise and when not to. And I think that this is such an old problem for the left and I think, our survival depends on it. Here, here. I'm so with you on this, Beth. Um, so what words of wisdom would you give our younger generation? I know you have a son, a very accomplished son. And um, and what would you what would you offer our younger generations as they are growing up in a planet and in a society that will be exceedingly more challenging than certainly what we grew up with? I think be inclusive, listen to each other um respect each other and don't shy away from from expressing what's important don't shy away from the arguments that we need to have discussions that we need to have good for you well i am honored to have lived on this planet with you um, and known you these last 40 years. And I'm so grateful that you agreed to be on my show and to share your wisdom and um, your visions and your accomplishments with my viewers. Beth Sachs, you're, you're an angel. I love you. And thank you so much for being on my show. And to my viewers, thank you for joining me and I will see you shortly. Have a beautiful day.